Hello and thank you for watching the first of a new series of videos here on the Derwin College YouTube channel. I'm Dave and I'm the digital skills teacher at Derwin and I'm tucked away in the corner of your screen because in the center of it, as she so often is in cinema and television screens worldwide, is the lovely Caroline Goodall. Hello. Hello. Greetings How are from you? Uh, my quarantine in lockdown <laughs> <laughs> in London. <laughs> Well, thank you for spending some of your quarantine time being the first guest on this new series of 10 questions with. Dave, I'm delighted. And I have to say, you really are the best interviewer in the world. And I just loved it when we were talking about the Bay of Silence way back, I think, in September, wasn't it? When it I was, was in Croatia yeah. shooting the Islander. That's right. I was shooting yeah. the Islander. One of my favourite costumes there, I might say. Oh, uh, I'm looking forward to watching that. <laughs> Well, I've got to say the students at Derwin and, if truth be told, the staff as well, have been very excited at the thought of you coming on and answering some of the questions from the students. So again, thank oh. you. You've made a lot of people smile at Derwin. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> oh, well, let's begin with the first question, which is from Ellie. What was your favourite memory about being in the Princess Diaries? Oh. There are so many memories for the Princess Diaries, um, so it's hard to pick one. I think possibly one of the most favourite has got to be the balloon popping scene, which everyone loves. And they always used to say to my daughter, oh, has your mum done that with, with you? <laughs> the truth be told is that it took forever to fill those balloons up with paint and tie them up with the paint. And um, the props department <laughs> were absolutely horrified and terrified in case we did anything wrong with them. But then once we started actually throwing those darts and popping them, it was magnificent. We were covered in paint. We were slipping on the paint. <laughs> it was just mayhem and havoc and it was just so much fun because the great thing is you didn't really have any lines that you had to remember or learn you could just sort of make it up as you went along so we just had, kind of had a few I you know a few hours playing because the thing about Gary Marshall God rest his soul um, is he was a stickler about the dialogue and of course I had to do an American accent and he also would make up jokes in the middle of a scene and he had two writers, Marty and Marty, and they would write jokes on little notepads and then they'd hand them to him. And then if he liked a joke, he'd yell over the camera while you were in the middle of doing a scene and just say, oh, Caroline, say this. And he'd just throw a joke and you had to kind of pick it up, lob it up and send it back. <laughs> Anne was terrific at it, I have to say. She was really, really good. I was always a little, uh, <laughs> not quite as good. So. Doing something like that where I could just improvise and just um, pop uh, paint balloons was just fun. That does sound like a fun day on set, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. It really does. And of course, you've been in a lot of movies, which leads us on to the next question, which is from Amy. Amy. Hi, Amy. What was your favourite movie you acted in? <gasps> Do you know, Amy, I've done about 43 films. And every single film has always been amazing. I always count myself terribly lucky that I managed to find myself in a position where people I work with are just exceptional and lovely. Um, so it's really hard to choose. I would say maybe we have to define it uh, into favorite and perhaps most significant and inevitably the most significant film that I have ever been a part of is Schindler's List and playing Emily Schindler in Schindler's List which um, of course you know won I think nine Oscars but also is now in the history books um, and I do remember when uh, my kids were doing history and this was in Italy and they came back with a history book and they said, look, mum, this picture of you. 
<laughs> and it was actually a segment on the Holocaust and uh, on the Second World War. And there was this picture from Schindler's List and a little bit of blurb about Schindler's List um, and what Oscar Schindler did. Um, and it was a picture of uh, myself and Ben Kingsley and Liam Neeson. And that was kind of something I have to say. So yes, incredibly significant to be a part of that film, to be a part of history, cinematic history, mm -hmm. and to be able to bring to millions uh, this extraordinary story that needed to be told. Um, so I would rather go for significant rather than favorite. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes, definitely does, definitely. <clears throat> and performing arts is a very popular course at Doing. Uh, and it leads us on to a question from Aeneas. What inspired you to be an actress? Hi, Aeneas. Well, um, I stuttered when I was a kid. I had a really bad stutter. And my stutter could happen on plosives, like a t -t -t or a d -d -d -d, or it could happen with um, an eye, like uh, 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 like that. And I think the freedom that I felt being on stage really was significant to me in that choice to be an actor, because strangely enough, and I know this happens to many people, the moment I learned lines and I got up and I performed and I was someone else, I lost the stutter. Mm -hmm. And that to me was sort of a revelation. I was able to be someone who wasn't me. <laughs> I was yeah. a bit embarrassed yeah. to be me. I would go into shops and I wouldn't know how to ask for something. I remember my mother, I think she tried to train me. She'd, she'd send me out to a shop and say, oh, could you get some butter and some this and that and come back? And I must have been about nine or ten. And I'd cross the road and I'd go to the shop. Um, and I go, uh, 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 but, and it was really like that. And then they'd yeah. try and finish my sentences for me. And that was just the worst. So, um, yeah, isn't it funny? And I think I was a bit of a clown. Um, so I love getting a laugh out of people. And I also loved words. I loved mm -hmm. reading. Yeah. Um, so they all kind of came together and uh, I just found that it was something that I really loved doing and I was quite good at it. And uh, when I was 18, I was in a school play and I was spotted, believe it or not, by um, a BBC director was a woman, her name was Dorothea Brooking. And she invited me to be a part of a BBC television series called The Moon Stallion. Uh, so I was 18 years old, I left school and I went straight to work. Um, and so it was amazing because it was something I wanted to do, but I had no idea how to go about it. And then I went to Bristol University and I did English and Drama. Uh, so I applaud all of you for studying. And I got my degree in English and Drama and I was a member of the um, National Youth Theatre as well. And those things kind of helped set me on my way as well. Wow. And I started in theater and I worked in theater for 10 years and at the Royal Shakespeare Company in the National Theater and uh, all around England uh, in regional theaters until I actually started making TV and film. Wow. I mean, this naturally leads us on to a question from Molly. How long have you been an actress? <laughs> well, if I own up to how old I am, <laughs> <laughs> you can probably guess, because I said 18 was when I had my first, pay. I was paid 80 pounds a week. Wow. And I had to write yes for the BBC. <laughs> and I had to write side saddle. Um, and that's how I got my equity card, because in those days, of course, it was union, it was closed shop, and you couldn't get a job unless you'd done 40 weeks work. And you couldn't get 40 weeks work unless you had a job. And um, I got very lucky and then I got a dispensation from the union equity uh, because I was able to ride side saddle. Um, and so therefore I was employed as a trick rider. Oh, so no one <laughs> that. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> and I had to gallop on this horse as well. Um, 
But uh, yes, so if you count how old I am now, which is, oh, a mere 42. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I actually, isn't it crazy? 39 years. No, 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 no. No, what am I saying? No. <laughs> we don't need Can't an exact figure. How? <laughs> Let's oh leave it at over 30 years. <laughs> over 30 and still going strong, thankfully. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My maths is normally quite good, but it's <laughs> Let in me, lockdown I've gone to pieces this is it. it happens to us all <laughs> but one of the movies that you've been in that was very popular when uh, everybody knew that you were going to come on to this was Hook which leads us on to a question from Heather what's it like performing on the sets of Hook do you know magic every day bang around <laughs> magic that was my first proper film. I was just turned 30. I had arrived in Hollywood. I had been cast by Steven Spielberg. I was walking on air. I was terrified. <laughs> but at the same time, I thought if I never work again, I don't care. And I need to just enjoy every single moment of this. I need to soak this up. It was a masterclass in filmmaking. Stephen and the whole cast, Robin, um, Dustin Hoffman, uh, were just so welcoming to me. I'm still terribly good friends with Jim Hart and his family, Jim wrote it. Um, and uh, it was, we shot on the Sony set, but it was the old Columbia studio. Sony had just bought it. And the main set was the Neverland set. We had about six stages, but the big one was where they actually shot um, the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. And that was the Neverland set. So it was enormous, but also it had this sort of extraordinary magic to it already because that's where the Wizard of Oz had been. I was in my element. I went every day, regardless of whether I was <laughs> shooting or not. I was a fixture there. I was so much a fixture that people would come down and visit the set because it was so extraordinary. You know, we had one stage with a whole pirate ship in it. <laughs> and then we had Pirate Town and you could just, you know, it looked real, it was real, you know, so you could go play. And um, there was always someone to play with. There was always some lost boys to <laughs> hang out with or someone. And um, I was, became such a fixture that they'd asked me to show people around. Oh, so I was the tour guide as well. Uh, and then on the days that, um, for example, Julia Roberts wasn't available and they were doing green screen, uh, which meant that Robin basically was on a wire mm -hmm. uh, pretending to fly as Peter Pan, they'd say, is Caroline on? <laughs> <laughs> and they'd say, could you just go and read Tinkerbell's lines off uh, with Robin, please? <laughs> the green screen <laughs> stage. <laughs> so I'd be Tinkerbell one day and then I'd go back and forth and I'd be me. Um, and uh, it was just a joy, absolute joy. And we all loved it. Um, and, you know, there were people playing cameos like Phil Collins, David Crosby. He was a pirate. Oh, wow. um, we had um, Glenn Close came in and was a pirate. And yeah. it was it's a great. Yeah. Did you know that there's that moment and there's a big close up and you, go, and you realize, oh, my God, that's Glenn Close dressed up as a pirate. <laughs> um, David Crosby, like we all stayed mates, and because it was just this huge big thing that was so much bigger than any of us. Um, so even the famous people felt a bit small. So we all kind of just sort of became a gang. And we'd hang out in each other's trailers. So, you know, we'd hang out in Robin's trailers and he'd just do an impromptu concert. <laughs> it was and Maggie Smith. I always had to go and buy Maggie's cigarettes for her. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Darling. And I don't know where to get silk cut in this bloody town. <laughs> Could you help? Me, darling. <laughs> so I'd go running off with 
my little VW Beetle bug go and buy her packs of silk cut and come back to the set. It was <laughs> fabulous. Fabulous. Yes. Oh, that sounds, I mean, that sounds like a wonderful time. And again, it leads us on perfectly to a question from Isabel. Hi, Isabel. Hi. Um, my question is, what is the funniest scene you have ever shot? You know, the funny thing is, is that comedy is a serious business, as Joe Walton said. Hmm. And the irony is, is that when you're actually shooting comedy you don't tend to be enjoying yourself very much <laughs> <laughs> because it is I mean you're enjoying yourself but you're very aware of technique yeah, yeah. Um, and timing and having to come straight in on your cue um, and to be able to support the other actors around you and so on one level you would say well surely if you're working with Robin Williams it's got to be the best fan and of course it was because we did a lot of improvisation as well I think some sometimes actually watching people work is probably the funniest thing mm -hmm. um, uh, I remember Charlie Cosmo who was child actor genius and uh, Robin working together and just working off each other and uh, improvising was just amazing. It really was. And I would be in stitches. And of course, but I wasn't allowed to laugh. I think, funnily enough, working in a theatre, you probably tend to have more fun doing scenes because you've rehearsed it and you're doing it. And you're doing a comedy. And then inevitably what will happen is someone will do something on purpose to try and make you laugh on stage. <laughs> And they call it corpsing. And inevitably what happens is that what you know, one person starts, they're meant to be meant to be really serious, and then suddenly their shoulders start doing this, and you realize, oh God, they're laughing, and then you try not to laugh. Um, I think probably the funniest was I was in Manchester at the Royal Exchange and I was doing a play called While the Sun Shines with Mick Ford. And it was in the round and this particular play uh, one we were meant to have uh, my character was meant to have a very big breakfast and I had to eat it all while talking at the same time and getting the laughs and I remember it was towards the end of the run and they decided to have fun with me and in came this breakfast and when the you know the thing was the tray was lifted there was about 10 sausages, five eggs, and <laughs> 20 pieces of toast. And I remember looking at it and I couldn't stop laughing. And they were all kidding, killing themselves as well because I had to eat this. Oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, I got to every single little bit. <laughs> eat it all. And we were in the round. So there was nowhere to turn because we had audience oh, all around us. No. Um, so yeah, I think, um, fun oh, there's loads of stories, loads and loads of stories. Um, the dressmaker was really fun because we had an emu that kept wanting to butt in to uh, every scene that we were in when we were outside. And it was a scene with Kate Winslet and myself and Sarah Snook. Um, and uh, we were talk we're meant to be talking about, uh, was it the dystosophy, what would they call it? The, the Shakespeare thing that we're meant to be doing. And um, uh, this emu, <laughs> So little things like that. Oh yeah, that's it. What is it about? Never working with children and animals and. <laughs> no, yeah, but this animal wasn't even employed to be a part of the picture. He just, just turned up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next question is from Anna. I saw you in a street cat named Bob playing a lady that saw um, Bob and his owner on YouTube and thought about making it into a book. What was it like being in the film and did you enjoy it? Oh, I did very much indeed. Um, yeah, she was, she was interesting. She was the, um, I met her in fact, she was sort of American, Anglo-American, so she had an interesting accent uh, that was almost English, but not. Um, she, was responsible really for saving this guy's life um, and uh, she saw him busking and um, 
she was just enamored with the cat and then suggested that maybe somehow she helped him write a book. Um, but that was really fun. Um, I sadly, Bob died. Yeah, it, yeah. so sad. I mean, incredible story. I, I actually have, I should dig it out. I have a little video I took on my phone. I remember when we were shooting in Covent Garden um, and it was great. They let us, you know, it was winter. So there weren't too many people around, but they let us shoot in Covent Garden. Mm -hmm. And um, we're in St. Paul's Church. The Actors Church was where we kind of had our green room. And um, I remember that's where Bob would be uh, with his uh, owner. Um, and I remember I took a little video of Bob, so oh. I should see if I can find it. But he was an adorable cat and they trained a bunch of cats to play him. Mm -hmm. And those, the other cats were dreadful. They were all brought over from Canada at great expense. And in the end, actually Bob ended up being, you know, in the movie more than the other cats because he was the only one that would sit on the shoulder and uh, mm. or on the guitar and he'd do his thing he was extraordinary extraordinary cat just lovely yeah it's great that his story's there you know you can read yeah. about it you can see it on the screen now it is really good yeah. and so we're talking about movies with the students uh, which leads to this question from joseph uh his question is what is your favorite movie to watch Oh, wow. It's always a tricky one, isn't it? That I'm not sure if you're like me, it changes all the time, too. It does change all the time mm -hmm. because inevitably, I think you watch movies sort of for your mood. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes. And, um, you know, I'm going to say something. It's a movie that I, it's Charlie Chaplin, The Great Dictator. I think it's one of the most extraordinary films I've ever seen. It was prescient. Um, you know, it was, he saw Hitler for who he was, I think, and realized that in order to make a film that would have some impact, he had to somehow also make it comedic. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a, vast film on so many levels and I think I always loved Chaplin because again I've always loved comedy and I love physical yeah. comedy and that scene that he has when he's lying on the desk and it's almost balletic and he's got the world above him and he does this sort of ballet thing with his feet mm -hmm. and it's just so extraordinarily inventive and prescient um, and I think, yeah, there's something about that film that draws me back every time. Um, there are so many wonderful films. I would say I don't like watching films I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> what was the last film that you watched with you in it? Can you remember what that was? And when it was, maybe. How long ago was it? Was it a while? Oh, oh, I know, of course. Yes, I was forced to. <laughs> <laughs> I recently wrote and produced a film called The Bay of Silence and I have a small role in it. I didn't write myself a role. The director said, why don't you play Clay Spang's boss? Um, and I'd written a guy and actually I kind of wanted Clay Spang to have a male friend. But, you know, we're now in this time where we have to make sure that everybody's 50-50. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. So um, they ended up casting me uh, as his boss. Um, so, and who wouldn't want to wear a clay spang on exactly, screen? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> He's so fantastic. <laughs> He's one of the nicest people in the world. He's completely irreverent. And we just had a lot of fun. We just did. Um, but, uh, so yes, I was forced to watch myself over and over in the edit. <laughs> I kept saying, could you cut me out a bit more, please? I had this scene with um, the wonderful Alice Krieger uh, in, the, in a party scene in the garden. And I just said, no, no, look, that scene's just going on for too long. Could you just cut me out? Keep Alice, but just, just cut me out. <laughs> so there you go. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> the next question is from Karis. Uh, Karis's question is, 
what is your favourite costume that you have worn in a movie? Ooh. And you've had a lot of costumes, haven't you? You've had I have, and ones. I tell you, costumes are so important when you're an mm. actor. Um, you know, there are some people who just go, oh, look, can I just wear jeans and a hmm? Like, actually, um, who is it who loves to do that? Um, oh, brain freeze. But I actually really find a costume so really important for the character. Um, and as they say, we start with shoes. Mm -hmm. um, but oddly enough, I think recently, actually, uh, one of my favorite costumes uh, is for this film called The Islander, which I really hope comes out soon, you know, subject to COVID and everything else. And it's a kind of um, dystopian, apocalyptic, futuristic sci-fi kind of movie and the designer is, costume designer was fantastic so because it's all a bit steampunk mm -hmm. um and i play this woman called the baroness and she's actually super cool which is rather nice at my age to be <laughs> asked to be someone super cool and you know she kind of you think she's the baddie but maybe she's the goodie you're never really sure and she is head of this sort of the navy because the whole of the world is now submerged in water and is basically island. So therefore she's important. And I walk around in these fantastic kind of black capes and hats. And I've got these steampunk sunglasses as well. And um, I just felt you feel so emboldened in that kind of costume. You really do. Um, and it sort of, just felt a bit kind of Marvel comic -y, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And of course, then the other one was Cliffhanger, where I'm in leathers the whole time. And they were fantastic because I was right up on the mountain. And that, of course, is leathers as ideal. But also, of course, if you're doing an action movie, leathers as de rigueur. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I still have I still have the jacket and I still have the pants. I don't oh. know if I fit into them anymore. <laughs> um, I was very, very fit then, um, but really, really great. And the other best thing about that was the fact that I didn't have to change every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because ironically, much as we want our costumes to, uh, you know, represent us, in fact, the most it's the easiest is when you don't have to change. So I was in the same thing the whole time, but of course I had to have eight different versions <laughs> <laughs> because I had to be killed in one, there'd be blood on another, another had to be torn uh, and as on and on and on. So I had eight different versions of exactly the same jacket, and exactly the same pants. And what a great character you play in that movie too. I love, I love your character in that film. <laughs> It's, it's it, leads us, it leads us perfectly on to the final question, which is from Sophie. And Sophie's question is, and this is exactly how she wrote it, what was it like to work with Rocky? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Uh, leading on. He's quite something, Stallone. What everyone forgets is that he's a very fine writer. Mm -hmm. He wrote Rocky and he actually won an Oscar for Best Script, I think. Mm -hmm. And when we got to Cliffhanger, it was in a way, it was sort of kind of a comeback movie for him. Yeah, yeah. In a way. And um, so he was very aware. And he actually did a rewrite of that script that was also written by Michael France, who, of course, is very famous for Bond movies. And he never asked for credit or anything like that. Um, and I remember we sat around a very large table at this rather kind of lovely ski lodge that had been rented for him. And we did a read through. And I just kept thinking, wow, this is so much better than the first version I read. Because the thing about, you know, action movies is it's not really about what people say. <laughs> it's about the beats. It's mm. about what is going on. It's about the page turning and the action and, you know, who dies when, you know, and all of that and what's happening. And um, so I, I really respect him. Um, he, I think, saw his image very much as a dancer might. So the body was over there mm -hmm. and he was over here. Yeah. So, and I remember one time I asked him, I said, are you seriously going to do the whole film in just a t-shirt? It's freezing <laughs> up here. We're 12,000 feet high. And he said, oh, he said it was like minus 40 when I did, you know, 
when I was doing, um, was it Rambo um, in Canadian Rockies? This is nothing. Um, but also he said, the point is they need to see my muscles. Yeah. So he was very aware uh, yeah. of what his brand was. And I think these days we understand branding and we understand that side of things because it's become so much a part of our vernacular. But in those days, we didn't. You know, you're an actor. <laughs> you're, and to be as different as possible, doing everything you could. And he was like, no, this is who I am. I'm sliced alone. And this is my brand. I am an action movie hero. And this is how I make my money. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, he was producing all those films as well. Uh, so it was very much, it was very important that, uh, you know, he was, you know, if it did well, he did well. Yeah. Whereas for the rest of us, we're just employed and, you know, it didn't do very well. It was like, oh, well, I was in a movie, it didn't do very well. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my, I wasn't going to get anything out of it. So it's, it's a whole different thing. Um, so an excellent businessman um, and a pretty good actor. But he hated, he had a real fear of heights. And he admitted it. <laughs> so that's certainly not him climbing that mountain. <laughs> and the movie did do well and everybody got great reviews from it. Yeah. Well. Very good. That's a classic. It was, it like opened or closed can or something. Mm -hmm. And I was shooting something and I couldn't go. I was like, oh my God. Oh. I <laughs> Carpet on the closet. <laughs> what was I shooting? I was shooting. Was I shooting? No, I don't look. I I can't remember. I know it was something important. Disclosure, maybe. It was something important. I couldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> I missed. I missed the premiere in Hollywood as well. I missed everything. Every big party. I always missed it. I was. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way though because it means you know you were keeping busy with other projects so that that's good i guess i was i just i don't know i guess i was just too green i should have said no no sorry you let me go for that yeah. i think i was shooting like a bbc thing <laughs> <laughs> i think i meant to go to that i think it's important <laughs> enjoy the evening out why not <laughs> Oh, well, exactly. well, thank you, Caroline. It's been so good to see you again and have this chat. Oh, and have you, you on the, as the first guest on these shows and to answer the, the questions from the students. As I said at the beginning, they were so excited to get these questions to you. And it's going to be an absolute oh. blast for them to, to see you answering the questions. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you at any time. Um, and if you'd just be kind enough to send me a version of it, that would be absolutely great. And uh, yes, I need to dig out some photos to to sign don't i and sign some photographs she did here you can see the photograph that she signed for the digital skills class and now you can see the photograph of some of the students that were involved in this project all holding their individually signed photograph from caroline all of them as you can see very very happy indeed so to finish everything off, Caroline, thank you for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. And please remember, if you're in or around the area, everybody at Doing College would love to see you there. So please keep it in mind should you ever be there. And you'll have a very warm welcome indeed. Oh, well, I will. And thank you very, very much indeed. And uh, just take care. Look after yourself. Stay safe. Um, and hopefully soon when we've all got our vaccines, we'll be able to get together. I'd love that. Thank you. Thank you. I did.